bumpers down the door And all I saw was pizza galore So I stuffed my face, I couldn't even walk Couldn't last my shit, giggle, wiggle, and talk So I fell asleep with my face in my plate And the next thing you know, I was headed upstairs I'm sick, I'm When I had this sort of hunger up pain Walking down the street with the face in my box With my stomach gone, I like a hungry thought When I saw this scene, oh, was it a dream? I bit the rest of my side called Burger King So I went inside, started stuffing my face Didn't even think about the things I ate But when the bill came up, boy, was I shot I said, I don't pay for nothing, I'm the king of the slop Slop, slop Yo, what up? <laughs> What's happening, legend? What's good with you? <laughs> Just chilling. Thank you for joining me tonight. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. I'm chilling with the coronavirus beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going to wait for a little more uh, people to log on, then we're going to jump into it. Okay. No doubt. How was your, how was your day today? Everything's cool. Just kind of out of it. Um, You know, doing a little at-home workout. Always wears me out, you know. But other than that, everything's good. Cool. Um, what were you into and what was going on with Cool Rock Ski when you were, were told that you had to quarantine and New York was going to be on lockdown? Actually, to be honest with you, I was in, I was in um, Seattle. And okay. I was sitting in a, a Buffalo Wild Wings celebrating my girlfriend's daughter's um, birthday. And I saw the NBA was locked down. Then I seen NHL and then, um, you know, the upcoming NCAA um, tournament for basketball, college basketball. And I was like, oh, this is serious. So after that, it was like I was getting phone calls after phone calls like, yo, you, you good? You know, everything is about to be shut down. You good? What's going on? And, you know, it was just like um, the same kind of. Um, what are you, the numbness you had um, when I was in New York um, September 11th. Everybody was like kind of numb to what was going on because nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew what was happening. So everything was just happening at a, at a rapid pace. Kind of like what happened, I think it was what, March 13th when they had the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So everything was just like um, kind of the same feeling like I said like September 11th. You know, we were all at, at the barbershop watching it from day and night on TV on September 11th. And this is like something totally different because this is like an enemy that you can't see. You understand right. what I'm saying? So it, it, it was just something totally different, you know. But, um, you know, hopefully everything get back to normal. But what's, what's going to be normal? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> is there any way you can adjust your camera? They say you can still only see half your face. How about now? Got me? Got you. All right. Got the great beard and all that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you're sideways. Is there any way? My side? How about now? Is you're that still good? sideways. Can you adjust it a little more? Um, um, it was, there you go. How about that? that? That's good. All right. I'm going to hold it up like this. Yes, sir. Looking like Professor Hulk. That's all good. <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> Looking good to be 35. Yeah, right. 25. 25. My <laughs> boy. Give you extra 10. Um, how has the coronavirus affected your day-to-day -day activities? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, um, I don't know. I mean, you, you kind of just stay in the house and just watch what's going on, watch, watch what's unfolding on social media I try to stay away from the news because the news is just um, the media, you know, they tend to blow things out of proportion. So you try to get, you know, you're getting more information off social media than the actual CNN, MSNBC and Fox News and all that stuff. So, um, right. you know, you just try to stay abreast to what's going on. Other than that, it's kind of like um, you just got to live your life. 
You know what I mean? You can't, you can't, um, you can't let the media dictate what's going on in your life. Um, because we've seen this already. Like I said, September 11th, you know, everything was like a cold, a different cold, um, coloring going on, like this color orange and terrorist orange and terrorist dark orange. So, you know, you don't want to sit there listening to news 24 hours a day because it, it'll give you the wrong false of, um, information, you know, and, you know, so just try to stay abreast of what's going on through social media. What has Cool Rock Ski uh, learned about itself since being in quarantine? Um, oh man, that's a good question. Um, I learned patience. I tell you that much. I learned a lot of patience. I was a very impatient person, so when I would, you know, go to go to the gym or go to work or whatever, um, say I go to gym and I would go downstairs from from my gym that I used to go to, there was a supermarket, and I'm not good at standing on lines. I'm not good at traffic. I'm not good at none of that stuff. I'm like, I want to get in and out. And my thing was, um, I got that New York, Brooklyn mentality where it's aggressive, but it's not a mean aggressive. It's, a, it's just an aggressive, like, yo, let's get it on. And right. some people are really laid back. And, you know, if you're from New York, you can't be laid back. You got to be super aggressive. But it's not a mean thing. It's just, you know... Yo, the line right there. Let's go. You know right. So, so I learned to be more patient. I learned to um, I learned to pray more. To be honest with you, started praying a lot more. Um, I think this whole thing got us closer to whatever religion you're following. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a follower of God. So, whatever religion you're following, you you're paying more to more, um, paying more attention to your religion. So right. that's what I learned throughout this whole ordeal that's going on. Um, are things you know, loosening but, um, up there in New York? Um, yeah, everything's. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's always something going on in New York. There's always something going on between the cops and pedestrians, the civilians, um, whether it be Hispanic or black. That's never going to stop. Like I told people, um, well, I tell, I tell people right now, the cops have a new way of enforcing something. Like, they're sticking their chest out right now. Oh, you don't have a mask on? Oh, that's give us, that's give us a, a better reason to mess with you now. Right. Um, you don't want to give these cops right now any kind of lead way to bother you. You know what I mean? You want to just, <clears throat> you want to comply as much as possible, but the... the NYPD is going to have to ease back off their aggression. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just step to somebody for no apparent reason and start arresting somebody because it, start, it starts looking like um, Nazi Germany. You know what I'm saying? It starts looking right. like that, like that kind of enforcement. And, um, but I think New York is going to bounce back quicker than any other place because one thing about New York is we, we get restless really quick. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, where the natives get restless, you know what happens after that. So, <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a thing where um, it's a slow process, but, you know, we're going to have to deal with it for now. I just wish everybody would just calm down. You know what I mean? Like, right. Civilians and police just calm down and take a deep breath and let's just try to work with one another because it's not going to end well um, for either party if we keep on going at one another. You know what I mean? Right. So for everybody logging on right now, this is Quarantine Sessions, episode 24. I am with the legendary Cool Rock Ski of the legendary Fat Boys. Um, we got about 50 minutes to cram your history in, so pardon me if I jump <laughs> over some things. But I want to touch on some of the highlights of your career. Um, right. Can you, can you take us back to where you were born and raised? Born and raised in East New York, Brooklyn. Uh, me and Mark, Marky e. D, were the first... I met him first on the block as far as um, growing up. Um, I didn't meet Buff till like I was like maybe 13, 14 years old. I met Mark when I was like seven, eight years old. Um, so um, East New York, Brooklyn was just a predominantly um, black and Hispanic neighborhood. And everybody just got along. I mean, if you're from the outside looking in, it looked like a straight jungle. Like, um, you know, like, like Vietnam out there. But if you was born and raised there, you didn't see nothing wrong with it. 
I mean, it was a really, really tough neighborhood. Really tough individuals out there, uh, like really high crime out there. But the thing is, we're, we're growing up, we didn't see that because all we did was play football and go to school, you know, and rap. Rap was like our second passion. Football was our first. So um, it was just so much fun growing up. It may sound crazy because I just explained like how crazy it was out there. But for us, it was just so much fun because we didn't see it like that. You know what I mean? So right. it was just... um. You know, especially the summertime, we had so much fun in the summers, you know. We had rats the size of cats out there, but wow. other than that, yeah, we had some big rats out there. <laughs> well, what was the day in the life of Cool Rock Ski and Prince Marky D uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s? Oh, man, just um, football, football, and more football. Um, we played football sun up to sundown. That was our thing, you know, um... We play other areas, other blocks, other communities, or whatever. Whoever wanted to play us, and we weren't the best, but we had the most heart. You know what I mean? So, um, and then Buff came along later on, like in, you know, in the early '80s, um, when Buff first came on the block. Um, Buff was on a skateboard. He was very athletic, very athletic kid, and um, he was fast as heck. So we would use him as the fullback. Couldn't nobody, nobody could bring Buff down. Nobody. I mean, it was, he was like a battering ram, you know. So we would use him like on third and, third and two, you know, third and three, give the ball to Buff. He's busting up and he's going for like 10, 15 yards easily. So um, you couldn't bring him, one person could not bring him down. So um, for us, that was, that was our thing. It was, it was, um, Football and then hip hop, you know. And then once we found out we wasn't going to make it to the NFL, so we just started playing, started doing hip hop 24 hours a day, you know. Right. What were some of your earliest memories of hip hop on the block uh, when you were growing up? Oh, man. The earliest memories was just uh, a DJ by the name of DJ Bobo. He had a crew called the Uptown Crew, and they pretty much dominated Brooklyn as far as, you know, his MCs, and he was the DJ. He was the most popular DJ in Brooklyn at that time. So us just going to the parks, me and Buff would go to the parks all the time. I mean, within maybe three hours of the DJ playing the set, somebody would shoot the park up. So that that was a normal thing. Somebody would just start shooting, and everybody would start running. But we would stand right where the rappers and the DJs was at, so it'd be in, inside the park. We would stand outside the gate and we just focus on the DJs and the rappers, like just study them. Because um, Buff was a DJ. Um, he was a beatbox, but he was also a DJ. So he would study the DJ. I would study the rappers. And, you know, we would go back to, to his house or whatever. He had, his brother had DJ equipment. So we'll use his brother's DJ equipment. We'll call up Mark. Yo, come over. Um, you know, we're doing some some freestyling. We call it freestyling back then. And we had like a microphone. We pass it back and forth and Buffett be DJing. So that was pretty much our, our first. We, we, were, we weren't good at it, but we was getting good at it. You know what I mean? So. So at what point did you know you were getting good at it and it was something you wanted to pursue? Um, When people started coming to our block and wanting to listen to us. We, was getting a, we were getting a name, and other rappers were coming on the block either to battle us or just to get in a cypher with us because they was hearing about us. They was hearing about Buff mostly because they wanted to rap while Buff did the beatbox, but they were hearing the names of D-Ski and Mark E.D. because that was D-Ski at the time. It wasn't Cool Rock, and Mark was just Mark E.D. Um, so then we started entering talent shows in our schools. We started throwing little party, um, parties in, in, in Mark's basement. We would clean the basement out, charge like 25, 50 cents a head. Um, so, you know, we started getting the name. We started getting the reputation. And people were like, you know, you know, these guys are pretty good. So started from there. At what point did the Disco 3 come about? Disco 3 came about because we were going to be called the Hypnotized Five. It was five MCs, Buff was the beatbox, and we had a DJ. Um, those guys didn't come to practice. They didn't want to come to practice at all. So being that me, Buff, and Mark um, were on the same block, these guys were from different neighborhoods anyway. And being that we were on the same block, we were like, you know what? 
let's just keep it between us three. So um, we called ourselves, um, we, we went from the Hypnotized Five to the Disco Three because for one, everybody had these elaborate big names like, you know, Grandmaster Flash Series Five, Treacherous Three, um, Van DC and the High Power Three MC. They all had these names and we were like, you know what? Let's just have a basic name for the group, but we have these elaborate rap names. So I changed my, my name from D-Ski to Cool Rockski, and Mark went from Prince to Prince Marky D, and Buff just called himself the Human Beatbox. So um, a lot of people laughed at first, they're like, you know, there's a Disco 4. We're like, yeah, we know it's a Disco 4, but we're the Disco 3. We're so naive to what was going on. Yeah, but there's four of them, it's three of us, you know, so, <laughs> but, uh, so we just kept the name, and we went with that. So. Uh, what can you tell me about the Tin Pan Apple After Dark Dancer Rap Contest? Um, that's a crazy story. Um, the Bad Boys was a group that lived on our block, in our neighborhood. And if anybody's familiar with the group called the Bad Boys, they made the first Inspector Gadget song before Dougie Fresh. Um, and they had a beatbox by the name of K-Love. But at the time, they were just the Bad Boys. They... My sister told um, me and Mark about this contest called the Tin Pan Apple Rap and Dance Contest. And she said, you guys are always rapping and making all this noise on the porch. Why don't y'all just join the contest? You know, the first place prize was a um, recording contract. And I think they're giving our DJ equipment. We heard nothing but DJ equipment. We didn't hear nothing about the recording contract. Because we were like, we don't want to make records. We just want to get um, better equipment and rock parties and get paid off that. So, um, the bad boys entered the contest as well. So they said, so we went up there on a Saturday morning with the bad boys. And their idea was if they won the contest and won the record contract, they were going to put us on one of their records when they make an album. So we were all excited riding the train up to the Bronx, our first time in the Bronx. So we, we just stayed in Brooklyn. We didn't really travel like that. We didn't go to the Bronx and Manhattan and Harlem all that. We just stayed in Brooklyn. Anyway, we go to the Bronx at the legendary Disco Fever and the bad boys go on stage. So while they're performing on stage, the guy that you see in Crush Groove, the big guy that said we couldn't get inside the club, his name is Mandingo. That's what they, I don't know, that's what they call him. So he gave, he put a, a number around Buff um, that um, indicates that we're next. He said, you guys are next. We're like, we didn't enter the contest. They're like, you next. Just like that. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so we go on stage and Curtis Blow and uh, I think one of the guys from the um, the Fearless Four, I think it was um, Mike C, the judges. And we go on stage and we didn't know what to do. So Buff was like, yo, just freestyle. Just rap off top of the head. So that's what we did. And as soon as we started rapping and buffed the beatbox, the whole place went crazy. Even the rappers who were entering the contest. Everybody, they never seen anything like that. So we get off stage and somebody whispers to it, you guys won. Before they even announced, they said, hey, you guys won the semifinals. We're like, we won? <laughs> like, you know, oh, shit. Like, so... He said, yeah, you guys are the winners. They're going to announce you guys who's the winners. So they announced it. And the guys, the, the guys, the bad boys who brought us up there, we could see them in the audience just looking at us like they wanted to kill us. Like, yo, how dare you do that? So we're riding back home on the train that night. And one of them was like, yo, if you win that record contract, you got to give it over to us because you shouldn't have been in that contest anyway. Like, man, we ain't giving you no damn contract. <laughs> so, but that was funny. And we got back on the block and, you know, we're always on the block. So when we got back on the block that, that evening, everybody was looking 